Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, Happy New Year, if it's not too late. Uh, probably is too late, 25th of January, but anyway. Um, welcome to the CEO's first Power Hour of 2022. And um, I think we're kicking off with a really topical subject uh, today with the uh, Environment and Sustainability Director of British Steel, Lee Adcock, who's going to be talking to us. Um, I'm Joanna Oliver, CEO, Director of Global Programmes, um, and uh, I should give a plug for our FutureWorks event, which is the uh, in-between year event for PlantWorks, if you like, and it's a mixture of some fantastic conference speakers and also some showcase exhibits that we're partnering with, National Highways, HS2, supply chain sustainability school and commit to drones and also the cabinet office uh, and uh, hopefully if you don't know about it we will be sending out some invites very soon uh, just a quick run through the rules of the CEA house it's the webinar as always is held in accordance with the CEA's corporate compliance rules which can be found on our website uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available after the event uh, with the slides from our presenter on the CEA website. Please don't forget to stay on mute unless you are called on to ask a question. And if you'd like to ask a question at the end, um, please use the Zoom chat box to write it in. Uh, Lee's very kindly said that he will take questions offline afterwards if we don't get to your question. So uh, even if it looks like there's lots of questions, please add yours in. Um, Please turn your videos off. Not everybody is fortunate enough to have a fast uh, internet connection. And please don't complain if you or I or we have any technical difficulties. We're doing our best. It's quite foggy here, but hopefully it will be all right. So I'm going to call now on David Wayne, who is the Commercial Director of British Steel and uh, Vice Chairman of the CEO's Management Council to introduce our speaker. So David, over to you. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, just to echo Joanna, Happy New Year to, to each of you. Um, I've been involved with the CEA um, around about 10 years now um, for the last three years. Um, well, actually, last two years, when I think about it, coming into third year as the uh, vice chair um, on the management council. So, um, yeah, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to um, Lee Adcock. Lee is our environmental and sustainability director at British Steel. Huge amount of experience within the industry. Um, worked at both um, stainless steel plants and carbon steel businesses. Uh, very, very good technical knowledge and understanding of uh, both electric arc furnaces um, and uh, blast furnace um, operations, which is, is what we have at our integrated site over at uh, Scunthorpe. So with no further ado, I'll, I'll pass you on to Lee now, who can uh, take you through the presentation. Thank you very much, David, and thank you for that introduction. That was very kind. Um, <clears throat> yeah, like, uh, like David said, uh, I'm the Environment Sustainability Director for British Steel. <clears throat> and what I'm going to be doing today is run through a set of slides that, that, uh, that, that aim to explain to you what British Steel Low Carbon Roadmap is um, and, and where we want to be in the future. But also in doing that, hopefully giving you a bit more information about uh, sustainability, uh, both within the steel sector and also, also British Steel. And where we want to start <clears throat> is almost right at the back at the beginning. Uh, in terms of some of the reason why this topic is so important. Um, and as I'm sure most people are aware, or hopefully everybody's aware, you know, the UK has set itself ambitious targets for CO2 reduction in terms of a 78% reduction of emissions <clears throat> by 2035 from the 1990 levels. And also, of course, UK was one of the first countries to sign up to the Paris Accord um, to achieve net zero by 2050. Both of these, you know, broadly described, but especially the latter part, are all aimed at, at meeting the Paris Agreement goal, which came out of COP25, which is all about holding global temperature rise to well below two degrees and pursuing best efforts to limit increases to 1.5. So that's kind of the legal framework, at least in the UK, 
for what we're trying to achieve. But of course, it, we're not just driven by pure legal uh, requirements. It's also important to understand uh, what customers like yourselves and, and non-governmental organisations want from us and, and, and then describing that. And there was a lot of people on the call who fit into one of those two categories. And we know that science-based targets and the science-based target initiative is one way that large customers uh, that buy from British Steel and also the steel uh, network, steel community, um, are interested in, in science-based targets. And Network Rail is one of the key customers for British Steel um, has got a science-based target, target, but also customers signing up to what's known as Steel Zero, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later, um, are also making a commitment which could align to a science-based target initiative. And some of those customers are, are listed there, and you can see that they represent many uh, in the construction sector, um, which is a, another sector that's really important for British Steel. <clears throat> and the science-based target is also a framework for achieving greenhouse gas emission reductions that's in line with the decarbonisation required to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, which again is to limit global warming to well below two degrees C uh, pre-industrial levels and pursue best efforts to limit warming below 1.5. So whether we look at the left-hand side, so the UK national legal targets, or the right-hand side, some of these customer and non-governmental targets, we can see that both align, as they should do, to the Paris Agreement and ultimately limiting global temperature rise. <clears throat> but I think it's really important just to spend at least a few minutes understanding uh, the context of, of why there is the focus on steel and why steel has got an important and valuable role to play in, in helping both the UK and the globe uh, decarbonise. And the graph we're sharing on the screen here shows from the year 2020 the, stock, the top CO2 emitters from industrial processes and energy. And you can see on the far left hand side that the largest of the UK uh, industrial emitters um, is the Drax power station, which is probably no surprise to people that know um, energy sector well. Uh, probably more surprising, and, and it is a change from the last, maybe from 10, 5, 10 years ago, is that the next two largest. First is the Port Talbot Steelworks operated by Tata Steel, and thirdly um, is the Scunthorpe Iron and, in, Iron and Steel Integrated Steelworks. So, so we can see that from a UK perspective, the two integrated steel making sites in the UK, operated by Tata at Port Talbot and British Steel at Scunthorpe, have got really significant role to play into helping the UK meet some of these ambitious targets it set itself to decarbonise. And interestingly, you can see from the rest of that list, so the rest of the 23, <clears throat> uh, predominant, or the rest of the 22, predominantly power stations. So not only, uh, you know, we in the top three in terms of CO2 emitters, but we're, you know, one of, you know, one of the largest industrial sources of, of CO2 um, in our own right. But of course, we're not just, it's not just important on a, on a national scale, it's also important to understand where we are globally. And we know, depending on, on scope and boundary and, and, and numbers, we know that globally between seven and 9% of all man-made CO2 emissions are from steel making. So whether we look from a UK perspective or a global perspective, we can see that steel making has got an important part to play in terms of uh, answering this challenge we have on climate change and helping the world decarbonize. And I would add at this point as well, that from a UK perspective, you know, it's important to recognize that the, you know, the, the two integrated steel sites and the, the one operated by British Steel, not only op offer a fantastic opportunity to decarbonize, but by decarbonizing them, we go a long way to reducing uh, the CO2 emissions of the UK as a whole. So uh, certainly we could, we've got a lot to offer in terms of our supporting role um, in the UK context. In terms of where most of the emissions come from, I think it's always important to understand the data uh, and where emissions are, are derived from. And typically, uh, be in steel sector or industry uh, or energy, we often refer to uh, greenhouse gas emissions by scopes, and we typically call those scope one, scope two, and scope three. And scope one is the direct emissions, and they could be things like company direct emissions from 
processes. So for us, our iron making, steel making, coke making uh, activities all have direct emissions of greenhouse gases, predominantly uh, CO2 for us. And at British Steel, we also have on-site electricity generation. So we also operate a very large power station and steam generation capability. And those also have, have greenhouse gas emissions associated with them. Scope two, uh, typically, and certainly for British Steel, is all around purchased electricity. And scope three is all the upstream and downstream emissions that are effectively not captured by scope one and scope two. And again, the vast majority of those for, for a steelmaking company and probably actually most steelmaking companies are, are the raw materials uh, and then things like company vehicles, transport, business travel, uh, and then there's a few other activities that would fit into that scope three emissions. But again, you know, if you remember, I said that we should be driven by the data and understand not only how those, uh, how those are separated into those three different categories, but also where the majority of the emissions are. And when we've analysed the situation for British Steel, we see that around 89% of all the greenhouse gas emissions are scope one. Uh, only about 3% of our total CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions are scope two, um, and around 8% are scope three. So, so we've said in this early phase in what we call our low carbon roadmap, our focus would be on our scope one and scope two primary uh, emissions, and that would be our primary focus from, from last year through to 2035. Because at the end of the day, that represents 92% you know, you know, of all the greenhouse gas emissions, and that's what we should focus on. But, but it's also important to, to understand how we measure those, not just where, where those are and, and where we find those CO2 emissions. Um, and we do that very systematically, and I'll, I'll explain it on this slide. So our scope one emissions are measured through our emission trading scheme data, which has third party annual verification. So every year, all of our direct CO2 emissions from our main processes that we operate to make steel um, are verified by a third party that look at all the data uh, and produce a verification statement uh, that's uh, actually lodged then with the Environment Agency. Our scope two emissions are using uh, the UK government greenhouse gas conversion factors so that takes the average CO2 intensity for uh, purchased electricity, and then we use those standard factors against, uh, against the electricity we buy in. And then we use uh, World Steel methodology from, from, that was developed a number of years ago to help steel companies assess their scope three emissions. And we do an assessment based on that methodology to understand uh, that 8%, if you remember what I said, was from scope three emissions. So we can see from this that, that, that we're saying that nearly 90%, 89% of all the greenhouse gas emissions uh, are subject to this third party annual verification, which is really good, gives us really good confidence in the number and the data we're analyzing and setting targets for ourselves. So that's a little bit around uh, where we are in terms of legal framework. Um, and context in terms of global emissions and, and UK emissions. But it's also important to understand where customers and market pressure is coming from. And it's fair to say uh, that you know, a lot of customers, um, and certainly more than it was a few years ago, want low embedded carbon in the final product. Um, and this really is a change from probably at least you know, five, 10 years ago, um, when carbon and carbon emissions in product was, was either not asked um, or is a very infrequently asked question. Now, it tends to be the question that dominates sustainability questionnaires. But of course, there are different production methods that can show advantages or disadvantages on greenhouse gas emissions. And it's important just to, just to show you that, to under, understand again, context of, of what's happening uh, across the steel supply chain network. And we can see typically um, when we look at the two main production routes for steel, um, either you can buy steel predominantly from electric arc furnace steel making. So that's using uh, high percentages of scrap with electricity to, to melt, to effectively remelt the steel and produce new steel. Or it's through blast furnace route that obviously uses virgin ores as well as some recycled content um, in order to produce um, virgin clean steel. 
And as you can see, there's quite a big, big difference. Um, the numbers are highlighted in, in white in the center of those boxes. So electric arc furnace typically has a CO2 intensity uh, or an average CO2 intensity of about 0.44 tons of CO2 per ton of liquid steel. Uh, and blast furnaces globally have an average around 2.15. But you can see, I've also put on the bars of, of where the max uh, and the min. So you can see that electric arc furnace ranges all the way from around 0.2 to about 0.8. Um, and blast furnaces run all the way from about 0.17 to nearly three, which is uh, which is obviously quite quite a, quite a, quite a bit high on the extreme end there. So so there is quite a bit a big difference, but it's important to remember that virgin steel is required um, from the blast furnace route still to provide scrap in the future for electric arc furnace, because you know simplistically the the, ava the availability of scrap globally or even on a UK level. Um, is below the steel demand um, and will be for some time. Uh, there are lots of predictions that that will come into equilibrium at some point, but that's probably going to be 2050 and beyond before we've made enough steel um, on a global scale to then have that steel back as scrap to make new steel again. So, so we, 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 we can see that there's absolutely this still requirement for the blast furnace route uh, for the foreseeable future. Otherwise, we'll run out of steel. And also thinking about those customer uh, requirements and those market requirements, I mentioned Steel Zero earlier. Uh, Steel Zero is, uh, is an important uh, influence in the market at the moment, especially on the construction steel side. And it's from the Climate um, Action Group. Uh, it's one of their main campaigns. And what they're encouraging people that buy steel in the construction sector is to make two commitments. And the first is a long-term commitment to procuring 100% of steel by 2050 that is net zero. And there's also an interim commitment that they will also commit to procuring 50% of the steel by 2030, meeting one or more of the following combinations of conditions. And they are that the steel by 2030, so this is 50%, carries a responsible steel, a certified steel certificate, um, or an equivalent international standard. I'll skip to the last one. Um, or is a low embedded carbon steel as defined by the Steel Zero um, Appendix A in their, in their standard. Or it is steel produced by steel maker whose owners um, have a defined publicly and made public a long-term emission reduction pathway and also um, have an approved science-based target with the Science-Based Target Initiative. And that's where uh, why, why we mentioned that at the beginning. And the way we see ourselves as British Steel is, is having this science-based target in order to help validate um, and signpost to the outside world our commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll, I'll talk more about that when I come to what we're actually committing to in a few slides time. We also know that uh, the climate group um, uh, through some of their sister campaigns are also looking um, at becoming more active in other segments. So I mentioned that Steel Zero is focused on construction steel. We know that they are also interested in um, having a standard and a campaign around, um, around automotive and other sectors. So I think, I think this is an important one to, to look at and think about um, regardless of which sector you currently sat in in terms of a, been a steel purchaser. I think the other thing that's really important, especially in the short term, uh, and I'm meaning in the next few years as we go through the rest of this decade, is that, is that currently, if you remember when I presented a couple of slides ago, we said that electric arc furnace, EAF steel making, has got lower CO2 emissions than the blast furnace route, also called the, the basic oxygen furnace route or BOF route. And we can see that, that roughly 71% uh, um, of the global supply of steel is currently from that higher greenhouse gas emission route, um, which is the BOF route. And about 29% is supplied through the electric arc furnace route. And certainly we've had conversations, and I, and I know it's an active conversation that happens in the supply chain, that, that people say uh, to people that are buying steel, so this could be an end customer, well, I would like to have just electric arc furnace steel in my project because I can claim 
to have lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions for my project. And so what that's doing is effectively moving a percentage of market share out of the BLF route and obviously into the electric arc furnace route. But we have to think about steel as a, as a manufacturing route. It's incredibly capital intensive. Uh, we don't build new integrated steel sites um, overnight, if at all, and they cost many billions of pounds, dollars to build. Uh, so, so it's not as if change, you know, somebody changing behavior of specifying a thousand tons, 5,000 tons of steel or hundred tons of steel from wrong, one route to another is gonna prompt somebody to build a new steel mill. So all really we're doing when we have this behavior and decide to specify one route over another is actually displacing the same amount out of the electric arc furnace route and back into the BOF route. So if you just think about that again, you know, somebody decides to buy EAF instead of BOF, um, they, they, take some, uh, they take some supply share out of the EAF route, and then that whoever then comes in after them um, is effectively forced to go into the BOF market. And really, when we think about that, we think about that holistically, switching supply in the short term is not helping limit global temperature rises because the production and that split and the world market for steel production is not changing. So, so this is really, in my mind, problematic because we're not really solving the problem. All we're doing is creating short-term disruption of, of supply chains. And also from a UK context, it's important to remember that the steel sector in the UK um, is a significant contribution to the UK economy. And in 2020 alone, the steel sector contributed around 2 billion to uh, GVA of the UK. So uh, we do have an important role to play in, in supporting the UK economy. So hopefully by now we've been through the legal framework and some customer requirements. We've also spoken about, about where, where steel is globally. If you remember, we said between seven and 9% of all CO2 emissions are globally are from steel making. And we also understand that there are external pressures are not, and there are different production routes that give different greenhouse gas emissions. So, so what, is, what is British Steel doing? And, and what we're doing is, uh, and if I just actually just pause at this point and say that, that we've been on quite a journey, I would say, since the days that we were in liquidation, and I'm sure many of the people on the call will, will remember those, you might be involved with us, and if you weren't, you might've read that in the paper. And now obviously we came out of liquidation in, in March, 2020, with new owners really invigorated and focused on helping British Steel have a long-term vision for where we want to be in the future, not just a short-term vision uh, in terms of profit and loss. And that's really been the key enabler for us to sit back and work on the low carbon roadmap in terms of how we want to make steel in the future in order to still be here in the future, but with a much lower greenhouse gas and CO2 emission intensity. So what we've done is we've, we, we've developed a low carbon roadmap that works towards a phase reduction of CO2 by 2030, 2035 and 2050. That reduction is in line with the UK commitments to the Paris Agreement and also the UK 2035 carbon reduction target. So we really think this, this plan is ticking all those requirements we spoke about at the beginning of the presentation. The plan is ambitious and we have deliberately designed it in that way because we think this is what the world needs in terms of the steel sector in order to hit some of these ambitious reduction targets. And our low carbon roadmap um, will achieve an 82% reduction by 2035 through deployment of using new electric arc furnace steel making capability, as well as using carbon capture and storage on what will be an existing blast furnace production route. And I'll show you that graphically uh, in a couple of slides time. And a British Steel low carbon roadmap meets the carbon emission expect reductions expected by the UK Committee for Climate Change six carbon budget, is in line with an emission reduction required by the steel sector methodology as described by the science-based target initiative. So not only is this target ambitious, um, and, and really fantastic news for the UK and the steel sector, but it also meets these other uh, drivers that we have 
the UK's requirement to, to decarbonize by 2035 and also helps us align with the science-based targets in order that we can still supply steel to customers signing up to things like Steel Zero in the future. So how will we do that? We've got, we've got a couple of slides that's just going to walk through that. First of all, I'll show you by category and percentage reduction. So if we start where we are today, we foresee that through a combination of process and material efficiency improvements, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll mention these a little bit more specifically on the next slide, we think we'll achieve a 23% reduction in CO2 intensity against our 2020 baseline. We also think that our low carbon and iron making, uh, iron and steel making process that we want to adopt, and that would be through uh, electrification and also optimization of our current route, will achieve around a 20%, 26% reduction against our baseline of 2020. Carbon capture and storage will play a crucial role in decarbonizing our carbon intensive processes that we wish to retain and that will reduce about 29% against the baseline of 2020. And finally, and certainly not least, uh, and, and certainly it's quite important as well, we get about a 3% reduction from the use of hydrogen and also uh, electricity grid decarbonisation, which we know the UK is committed to um, over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and we know that from, from the last year's Conservative Party conference, there's a, an, also an aspiration that, that to achieve net zero for electricity supplied by, by the mid 2030s. And that fits nicely with our increased electrification over that same time period. So just to show you that in a slightly different way, um, what, we've, what we've done on this slide is to, is to map out that reduction pathway as we move through certain key uh, trigger points and, and, and points along our journey. So we've mapped out here uh, from our baseline of 2020, where we start with our current CO2 intensity uh, per tonne of liquid steel, and that's on the top of the grey bar on the left-hand side. And then what we've done is the top of the green bar on the right-hand side represents where um, the science-based target initiative would like us to achieve as a minimum. And I think the first thing that I always point out on this slide and, and thing that gives me great hope um, for the future is that our low carbon roadmap isn't just aiming for the bare minimum in terms of a science-based target. It's aiming for a significantly lower performance or better performance than the science-based target would have us aim for. But how do we achieve that? We'll give you some numbers on the slide, slide above. Let's just replay that through in terms of some of the key actions. Well, the early days, which essentially was, was last year into this year, and then over the next couple of years, is an increased use of scrap um, in our existing process and also um, an increase in things like ore based um, and recovered metallics. And that could be through our blast furnace or through um, our basic oxygen steel making at Scunthorpe. And that will deliver us um, a good starting point to decarbonize in the short term. In the, in the mid to the start of the second half of the 2020s, we'll adopt electric arc furnace steel making in order to have this twin route of, of having both blast furnace steel making capability as well as electric arc furnace steel making capability. And then at the end of the 2020s and into the 2030s, that, that blast furnace operation that will remain will have carbon capture and storage applied in order to, to go from what will already be um, a low level of CO2 intensity down to, down to a, a kind of a, a market leading uh, reduction in intensity, followed by the, the use of, um, like we said, uh, decarbonized grid electricity and also hydrogen in our process as well to help us achieve the last bit um, of that significant carbon reduction. So I'm, I hope you can all see uh, and appreciate that, you know, it's easy to look at the number and say, okay, 82% reduction, what does that look like? It, it, is, it is vastly, it is, you know, hugely significant um, and ambitious. We clearly have a route of how we'll do that um, and, and we'll do it with this phased approach. In the early years, looking at raw material and process efficiency, in the mid years, through electrification, and then latterly through carbon capture and storage, uh, hydrogen and grid decarbonisation. 
we'll call this the hybrid model. Uh, and I think it's just important just to, to explain this, uh, what this will mean for, for, for British steel. And effectively, um, at the moment, typically when you look around the world um, at steel makers, steel makers tend to either operate electric arc furnaces or they operate blast furnaces. And there are a few exceptions, but, but not many. What we want to do from, with the low carbon roadmap is, is really drive this hybrid model forward um, so that we've got a true hybrid operating uh, model for our primary emission, the primary steel making, be that from a scrap route through an electric arc furnace or be that through uh, ores through, through the blast furnace. And it's really this common approach uh, that, we'll, that we're calling the hybrid model. And then of course, um, once, you go, once we go past that primary steel making phase into, into the casters, reheat furnaces and, and finishing end, that's effectively a common process uh, much the same as it, it is, it is as it is today, uh, just with things like hydrogen to help decarbonize the rolling mills that are currently using things like natural gas um, or works arising gases uh, to, to power those to power those furnaces. I think it's important also just to recognize that the low carbon roadmap um, isn't just around what we'll do on the production side. It's also what we'll do around the product side as well. And we recognize that uh, the products we make uh, and how they're used are, are important in terms of decarbonizing um, our footprint over the lifetime of these projects. And to give you three examples, uh, starting from the top left-hand side, we provide Zinoco rail, so that zinc-coated rail, which is used in many marine and corrosive environments to prolong the life of the rail. And of course, the longer the rail uh, can survive in those kind of corrosive environments, the, the less replacements required, less replacement you know, crudely means less greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a, that's a really good product for extending the life. We also make weathering steels, um, which similar effects on, on the construction side. And we have also things like S460M, which is a high strength steel, which ultimately means for, for a given length or a given application, you need less material in a beam which means that there's less CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions associated with making, say, a metre of that beam compared to a conventional beam. So it's important that we carry on with this product development to help produce products that decarbonise um, either in terms of reducing the supply of material or extending the life in an application or reducing the weight uh, that's required in an application. And also, of course, as we talked about before, We've got our on-site measures as well, increased scrap and optimization, electrification of the steel making process, carbon capture and storage, grid decarbonization, um, and hydrogen as well. So what happens next and, 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 and where do we go from here? Um, well, uh, if I just actually just start with something that isn't on the screen, but, but just to say this low carbon roadmap was launched on the 7th of October last year. Um, and you can go back on our website and read the news post about that, um, as well as quite a few frequently asked questions that we've, we've put answers to on there. And it's important to recognize that, that, that this is a, a plan, uh, a business plan, not just a sustainability or an environment plan. This is a business plan that, that, is, that is fully costed and understood and signed off, not only by our directors in the UK, but also our parent company as well, um, Ingenia Steel. And that's really important to understand uh, where, where, that, where that drive is coming from. We've committed um, to having a science-based target in the coming months. Um, and originally we were waiting for COP26 to see if that shifted any of these national uh, goals and targets we, we talked about earlier. Uh, but now that that uh, conference finished, we can move ahead with firming up and publishing our, 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 our science-based targets. Uh, the science-based target will use scope one and two emissions for setting the target value. But of course, we'll periodically review the split between scope one, two and three um, to understand whether we need to add scope three back in if that percentage grows, which undoubtedly it will do in the future as our scope one and two emissions uh, decrease. But of course, as we explained at the beginning, it, it, it's just right and proper that our focus and attention should be on the you know, nearly 90% of all the CO2 emissions in those scope one uh, and scope two emissions. 
And interestingly, you know, when you look at Science Based Target Initiative, um, and you can go onto their website, you can look at all the companies that have made commitments to have a science based target. Uh, there are many, uh, many, many, many companies that have made a commitment from all kinds of industrial sectors. Undoubtedly, you know, some from construction, I'm sure, automotive is in there, um, as well as people in different parts of the supply chain, including financial organizations. What is fairly obvious when you look at the list is that there are very few steel companies, and there's actually only six I could find. Um, and of course, I think, as David mentioned, I used to work for a stainless steel company, and uh, that was Outer Kumpu, and you can see Outer Kumpu is on this list, uh, which is which is which is uh, good for them. By having this science-based target, we'll, we British Steel will become only the seventh steel company globally to set the science-based target um, and meet this threshold for these this ambition ambitious CO two reduction targets. And I think that's really important uh, for people to to have a look at and understand, um, and also be able to engage British Steel's ambition. Um, on this topic. In terms of a low carbon roadmap, um, uh, I, this is it, uh, it's on the screen. Uh, so this is what we actually officially launched um, on the 7th of October last year. I don't intend to run through this. Uh, you can uh, go onto our website, BritishSteel.co.uk, um, and you can learn all, around, all about our low carbon roadmap and exactly what these different points mean. Uh, what, what we want to achieve from, from the slides we've run through is just a bit of an explanation around the level of ambition. So if you remember that we said that was an 82% reduction in CO2 intensity from the baseline year of 2020 through to 2035 and net zero by 2050. Um, but this is some of the some of the ways we'll do that um, and some of the things we are we are thinking about. So that was all the slides I had and I wanted to run through with you today. Um, I think if we just go back and, and open the floor for questions, if that's OK. That's great. Thanks very much, Lee. Um, it, was, it was really nice to see it so clearly described. Um, so congratulations on some excellent progressive slides that even I understood as a layman. Um, there's a few questions in the chat box. That, David, do you want to take those with Lee? Because um, you can sort out which ones in which order to take and if they link in. You around, David? Okay. Yeah, just coming off mute. So um, a couple of questions that we've got um, from Dave Roberts. How near is CCS to being a proven technology? Yeah, and, and, and I think that's a, that's a really good question. And, and we had a lot of internal debate. Um, what I omitted from the start of my slides is that um, the, when the business decided it wanted to investigate what, it, what its answer would be in terms of climate change um, at the beginning of 2020, uh, the, the chairman of British Steel, uh, Mr. Lee, gave the challenge to our chief operating officer um, and our chief operating officer um, asked myself and the technical director, who, who also was a was steel making manager for many years, to, to investigate and look at this and, and come up with a credible plan, which is what we've run through today. As we as we ran through that um, and we, we explored that, what what we what we realized is that obviously there's many different ways to decarbonize. And when you look at different steel makers, different steel makers will have different ways of um, different ways and different answers to this. But, but we, felt, we felt that carbon capture and storage is becoming um, a proven technology or is on the edge of becoming a proven technology in power generation um, and probably a little bit behind in terms of iron and steel making, which is partly part of the reason why we framed the implementation of CCS um, in the 20, late 2020s, early 2030s timeframe, because we think that uh, that would give you know, sufficient time for the development of that technology for us to roll it out um, and it be successful. So, so, so in answer to the question, um, it, it's, not, it's not a mature technology, um, but it's one that's, that's rapidly moving in that direction um, with steel making probably a little bit behind uh, where the energy sector is. Okay, thank you. The next question we had was from Craig Wood. 
the hybrid model obviously still includes a coke making requirement. Do you still foresee a role for coke by 2050? Obviously, COG is a key fuel for other parts of the iron and steel making process at present. Yeah, it is. And, 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 um, and if I kind of answer that in reverse, Craig, a little bit. So, um, yeah, obviously, at the moment, you know, an integrated steel site would use the works for rising gases um, to, to power the hot rolling mills that operate on the site. And typically we use uh, gases from steel making process and also gases from coke making process. That's that cog that Craig refers to. Um, you know, over time, that could be replaced by hydrogen. Um, so, you know, that, that's a possibility. And, and one of the benefits for Scunthorpe and, and the Scunthorpe Steelworks is that it's situated in, in, in the Humber region with the, with the zero carbon Humber cluster, um, literally on our doorsteps. So, so that, that, that CCS pipe work will run by the you know, entrance to the steelworks. Um, but it's actually a dual pipeline, so it will run captured carbon out to the North Sea for storage, but also hydrogen back out to users as well. So, so I think I think hydrogen will become um, an important part. Um, Twenty fifty is a little bit more difficult to foresee. Um, I think I think when we look at the availability of scrap um, and how that will increase, I think we're not quite at the crossover point by twenty fifty. Um, so there's, there'll still be some need for primary steel making in the twenty fifties, um, and that could require coke or another reductant which could be hydrogen um, but that you know, we talked about ccs has not been quite a mature technology um, hydrogen iron making is, is even less of a mature technology so a little bit further away but uh, um, coke will coke will phase out um, just not quite clear yet exactly what point it will phase out in the future okay a couple of questions with regards to um the financing of the investment. So what kind of in financial investment do you foresee and how do we plan to finance this? Um, also, another one that links into that will be um, what's the time frame from installation for the electric arc furnace? Um, yeah, so again, I'll just answer those in rows because it's a little bit easier. Um, time frame, uh, typically installation of electric arc furnace globally, uh, you're looking at anywhere from, from two to five years, you could say depending on whereabouts you are in the world, um, planning requirements, permitting requirements, and, and other uh, limiting factors. So anywhere from two to five years. UK, uh, it, you know, probably three or four years um, you know, is a reasonable time frame for that. In, in terms of financial investment, um, you know, we, we, we're not disclosing how much the low carbon roadmap will cost, but certainly, you know, it's hundreds of millions of pounds, um, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, we'll be looking to in, look into finance that through various routes. Um, and importantly, uh, you know, this is why it's important for us to, to declare this ro roadmap and also talk about it publicly. Um, you know, if that finance is coming from um, private finance, uh, where, whatever, in whatever form that might take, it's important that this is seen as green finance because it's helping you know, achieve significant CO2 reduction. So um, hopefully that will get the support it needs at the right time. Okay, a uh, question from Mark Andrews is, even with decarbonisation and considering blast furnace steel, what is your opinion of the West Cumbrian mining potential versus coal from USA, Russia or other imports? Bit of yeah, a political so, question there for you, Lee. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. So, yeah, you know, look, I mean, we, we, uh, as, a, as a company, we don't, we don't get involved publicly in talking about where, where coal imports come from or, or where, where coal supplies come from. Um, you know, clearly there are lots of different places coal or, or even, you know, purchased coke can come from, uh, and, uh, you know, America, Russia, other countries, you know, or, or, or some of them that, that supply those materials. Um, obviously, most people know there is there is the West Cumbrian mine that, that um, is looking for its planning permission to, to open. Um, and, you know, if that's available, then, you know, unsurprisingly, you know, we would take a look at that commercially. Um, I, you know, there is there would be a reduction in transport emissions by not shipping material around the world, but um, you know the majority of the CO two emissions associated with the use of coke is in the production phase, not necessarily in the, in the transport. So, so obviously that's where we're focused on our low carbon roadmap. Okay, um, question from Christopher Rivetuso: uh, Which blast furnaces do you plan to blow out in favour of electric arc furnace? What will be the electric arc furnace's crude capacity? 
Yeah, so um, um, we've we've not we've not shared that publicly. Um, you know, currently we we operate or we have four blast furnaces at, at Scunthorpe Steelworks. A lot of people will know, um, and we have two in operation at the moment. With one effectively been a hot idle third. Um, we've we've still got a decision to make around around which one will be the remaining one as we go through the twenty twenties. Um, and, and we've, you know, we're still going through that evaluation stage. Um, the the EAF crude capacity, um, again, we're not we're not declaring that at the moment for, for commercial reasons. But um, you know, if you if I say it in this way, you know, we're currently operating two blast furnaces. That's a that's a you know well known public fact. Um, we we plan to go down to one operational blast furnace, and we don't intend to decrease uh, the supply of steel. So. Um, I'll let people do their own homework and see what they can dig around from there. Okay, um, question from Lindsay Andrews. How do we ensure the workforce knows their role in the roadmap going forward and are on board? Yeah, and that's a really good question actually. And, and um, you know, and I think, you know, as we've seen from, from, from others, um, you know, any change to, to production can be hugely disruptive or, or concerning, even, even if it's not actually impactful for, for individuals. And, and as we've gone through the process, um, we've, we've uh, communicated at various stages with the trade unions um, about the low carbon roadmap. Um, and we've also done some uh, internal engagement last year as well. So when we launched our low carbon roadmap, uh, we, we have our own weekly um, internal uh, business newspaper and we had a special green edition last year where we talked all around the low carbon roadmap um, what it means for, for British Steel and, and, and how we'll deploy that um, and, and, and how what that means in the short term so so we'll, we'll do the same as we work through this journey um, we will carry on uh, you know, having those internal engagement with, with, with people make sure they're fully on board um, and I think it's fair to say you know when you look at you know, for instance, you know, the main unions that represent steelmakers and steelmakers workers, um, you know, they, they too recognise the challenge required um, and the ambition that's required from steelmaking. And there's lots you can read on the Unite and GMB website on decarbonisation and the important role, you know, and what's needed. Um, so I think, I think, you know, having this message um, and having this plan really helps, you know, give us some long term vision about where we go in the future. And uh, from Mike Hennessy, do you have a time frame for the installation of the electric arc furnaces? Yeah, so we, we're saying, you know, crudely, you know, kind of mid to, to the start of the second half of the 2020s. So somewhere in the 25, 26, 27 time frame. OK, excellent. And uh, last question of Christopher Rivetuso. Uh, what's the current crude capacity at Scunthorpe? Um, via the blast furnaces and the basic oxygen furnace and what percentage of capacity are they operating at this point? Yeah, so 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 we've the scum top sites roughly producing about 2.5 million tons um, of liquid steel a year. Um, and, and obviously that's running on on two blast furnaces as opposed to the four. So um, you know, depending on which which capacity or, or which limiting factor you look at, you know, production for Scunthorpe could be as high as 4.5 or 5 million tonnes. So we're probably operating about around 50%. But the site has operated at that level actually for quite a number of years now as, as, as a comfortable operating um, business as usual position. Yeah, very good. Okay, and that seems to have covered the, the questions. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. I think that's our, our best ever uh, number of questions. So thank you everybody for your input. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, Lee has kindly agreed to take any questions offline if um, you didn't get a chance to ask one or you've only just thought of one. Uh, moving on to the February Power Hour, uh, that will be on the 23rd of February and our friends at Off Highway Research will be talking about equipment types and future trends. Um, we'll be sending out the notice for that very soon, but um, the off-highway ones are always really popular and um, don't forget to book in as soon as you get it because we are limited to the number of people that we can take on these. So finally, 
big thank you very much to Lee for the excellent presentation and to David for introducing uh, Lee and moderating the questions and to all of you for coming. And I can see on the participants list, you've all stuck with it. So well done. No one's gone off and found something better to do. No, thank you. And if I could just add, thank you for thank you for um, letting me present today. I think it was yeah. really good uh, to do that. And thank you for the, everyone's questions and uh, comments that are coming in on the chat. I can just see. So uh, thank you very much for that. Oh gosh, there's a whole lot more. I'll leave it. Uh, I'll leave it running in the background and then send you uh, the questions, Lee. But no, that's brilliant. And if anybody on the call has got any ideas for future topics at Paras that we haven't yet covered, please let us know. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. And you can have oh nine minutes of your lunch hour left. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Bye.